welcome to the Every Nation Dorado Sermon of the Week. We hope you enjoy this message. Good morning, family. Today is Reach Sunday, which means for us that we want to reach the nations of the world. And as an Every Nation Southern Africa movement, we specifically want to reach all the countries in Africa, in Europe, and even beyond. So before I go there today, we want to pray for Egypt because when we reach means for us, we pray for nations. We also give to missionaries and mission teams going and we go ourselves into missions. So today is Reach Sunday at locally here and pray for a nation, which is Egypt. So I want to start by reading a scripture from Psalm 96, I read verse one to four. O oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord and bless his name. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Deter declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. And that is our heart to declare the salvation and the name of the Lord to all the nations so that all the nations can praise the God, Lord because he, our Jehovah God, is the one that is to be feared above all the gods. So as we pray for Egypt today, we do not yet have an every nation church in Egypt, actually in no country in North Africa. There are mission teams going scouting in Africa we as Namibia have to look a bit to our north, which is Angola. But at the moment, um, from every nation, Southern Africa, we all together, um, there are teams that have gone up the east coast of Africa. And we have a different church plants already, or churches established in Mozambique, in Zimbabwe, in Zambia is a church plant, which is part of our Namibian cluster. We have a church in Burundi, Rwanda still needs to be reached. We have a church plant in Kenya, in Uganda, in Malawi. So that's the furthest we are up, but we want to reach right up to Egypt, all in between. But every, as every nation, Southern Africa, it is our vision within the next couple of years, hopefully, we want to reach Egypt. So we pray today already for Egypt. So Egypt, the capital is Cairo, and that is the largest city, not only in, in, yeah, in the Middle East, in the whole Arab world is Cairo the largest city. The population of Egypt itself is 111 million, which is also the most populous nation in the Arab world. And the religion is Islam. But we have about 10 to 12% Christians, which are Coptic Christians, as you know from the Bible. The first church actually was in Alexandria, which is north of Cairo, on the coast in the Nile Delta. That was the first church already planted in the first century in Alexandria. So and from that time, there are still the Christians, the Coptic church um, is still alive and about 10 to 12% Christian, but has become, of course, as over centuries in most denominations, a little bit um, traditional as well. But so today we pray for Egypt and I first read the first two, I have five prayer points. I read the first two and pray for the first two, and then we go to the next three. So our first two prayer points are we pray for a growth of a biblically-based renewal movement in the Coptic Church. And secondly, we pray that the Copts may have a positive and transforming effect in their nation. So let us pray for those two points. Father God, I pray that within the Coptic Church, you start by your Holy Spirit a new renewal movement, a biblically based renewal movement, Lord God, that that church will grow, that you bring a new vibrancy into this ancient faith in Egypt. Lord, Holy Spirit, I pray that you touch and stir the hearts of the Coptics to draw them deeper into you, into a deep personal relationship with you. Lord, that you break them out from any traditional forms 
of worship and just traditional structures, Lord, that they will come into a personal relationship with you. I pray really for a renewal and a new vibrancy in the Coptic Church. And we thank you, Lord, that they have kept the faith for all these centuries within the mus Muslim expansion in the northern, in North Africa. And Lord, we pray secondly, Lord, that the Copts will have a positive and transforming effect in the nation. Lord God, that they will be the salt and the light in their society. I pray, Lord God, that they will influence their society just by living in that environment, being the light, being the salt, that that society will be transformed and that their light will shine. And Lord, that they will spread and be a positive influence in the Egyptian society amongst their uh, Egyptian people, Lord God, that there's an inside renewal in the society and environment in Egypt coming from the Coptic Church. Lord, and I pray that you make them strong to stand in their faith and endure against Islam, which is um, expanding. Lord, that you give the people a renewed faith and hope in you and strength and grace to stand in their faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. Then I will read the next three prayer points. Prayer point number three is we pray for the laborers in the harvest field, for God to put a mission team together and stir them and bring them to reach out to Egypt. And the fourth point is that we pray for the soil to be prepared and for divine, divine connections and open doors in Egypt. And our fifth prayer point is that we pray for Jesus to reveal himself to Muslims. So let us pray for these three prayer points as well. Lord, we pray that you send laborers into the harvest field, the harvest field that is so plentiful in the Muslim world and in Egypt specifically. We pray, Lord, for divine connections, that you connect the team that wants to go to people in Egypt, that you open doors for them. Lord, I pray that you would put a team together, that you stir in hearts of people, of your children, a love for the Egyptians, for the Muslim world. Lord, that you handpick people and stir a love for missions for, for the Egyptians in their hearts, and that you connect the people that have a heart for Egypt, that you connect them, that a team will come out of that, and that you, that you bind them together, that there will be a unity forming amongst these people that want to go. And as they come together and strategize, Lord, that you give them divine connections in Egypt, open doors in the society, in the community, even into campuses, Lord, that we can see within the next couple of years, a mission team from Southern Africa going up and, and scouting and planting a church in Egypt. And Lord, we pray that you prepare the soil and the divine connections for, for that outreach, Lord God. And as you put the people team together, Lord, that you um, prepare their own hearts and love for the people, for the culture to learn that, and also for the Egyptian people, Lord God. We pray for more laborers in that harvest field, that you raise up people and hand pick them to go. And Lord, last week we pray for Jesus to reveal himself to Muslims. Lord, I pray that by your Holy Spirit, Lord, you can even give them dreams or visions of Jesus Christ. As we hear so many testimonies of Muslims having dreams of a man in white. And when they speak to people, they find out it's Jesus. You're revealing themselves to them. And I pray, Lord, that you do that more and more. Give them a revelation of the only true God, that they know there is a God in Jesus Christ who really loves them and desires to have a personal relationship with them. Lord, I pray that you draw them unto their self, that many Muslims will come to a saving knowledge in Jesus Christ, and we pray for a harvest of souls in Egypt. I pray that in Jesus' name, amen. Lord, I bless Egypt. I pray for that nation. We speak the name of Jesus Christ over that nation, Egypt, and pray that your name will be glorified in Egypt, that you will be worshipped in Egypt, the only true God. We declare Jesus Christ over the nation of Egypt. Amen and amen, family. I encourage you to continue praying for Egypt this month. We say each Sunday where we pray together, but it's for the whole month, that we keep praying for Egypt, 
keep praying for God to raise up people with a heart for Egypt to go and plant a church in Egypt. Amen. Have a blessed Sunday. Hello, everybody, and welcome once again to the YouTube channel. It's always a wonderful blessing to be together. If this is your first time here, we want to invite you to subscribe and like this video if it blesses you and send it on to family and friends. We are always providing content for your spiritual growth. And we want to encourage you to be part of an actual church. If you are in town, please do join us in person. Today, we're continuing with our series. We've got about two more installments on this one. It's been running for several weeks transformational about set apart wealth and finances and i believe that god has truly planted a legacy enduring uh, seed in our families and in our hearts and that's the power of the word of god that it endures forever it goes from generation to generation and we've received so many testimonies uh, that were just transforming people's lives one in particular stands out that someone sent to me Apparently, when they joined the church, they were homeless at the time. And uh, God, in the meantime, has blessed them not only with a job. Uh, they were homeless and jobless. Blessed them with a job. Blessed them with a car. Blessed them with a house. And they're completely transformed today. We're going to bring that testimony online as well uh, in due course on the YouTube channel. So look out for that. Switch on the notification button so that you don't miss any of the things that we bring through. So I'm going to pray for us and then we'll get into our message. Father, we thank you, Lord, that your word is always, is always rich towards us with great wisdom and life. We thank you, Lord, that any area of our lives where we need impartation, we are receiving that through your word right now, that you are catalyzing our transformation and bringing about your purposes in our lives by your word. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we've, we've started the series of speaking about, in the first segment, speaking about how you have to choose as to who you will worship, whether it's God or money, and you must choose God. The second week, we spoke about how God is wealthy and how poverty is not to be associated with God. He became poor for our sakes, yes, but he is wealthy, and we explained that. The third week, we spoke about the mindset of stewardship, personal and national, and how you need to have a mandate and a mission beyond just uh, sort of making a living. Wealthy families don't just make a living, they transform nations. Then the fourth week, we spoke about blessings and miracles, the importance of how God provides for us, and how the Holy Spirit is involved in that process. The fifth week, we spoke about financial bondages and generational poverty. And we went into the scripture looking at how the curse came in and how we have been redeemed from the curse. Then the, the sixth installment we did was on work, the importance of work, the impact and the privilege of work and how God also works. The seventh installment we did was on giving and tithes and offerings and seeds and very practical ways of honoring God. Then the eighth installment was on family finance, God's way. We dealt with the dynamics of uh, trying to establish a godly uh, financial plan for your family and the, the issues that arise as a result and God's wisdom in that regard. Today, we are dealing with one of the most important aspects of this series, this series which is uh, the warnings on wealth and riches. And then next week, we'll deal with how to pray for finances. We'll take a, a brief recess because we're expecting Dr. June Escosar, who's coming to visit us um, from uh, the Philippines in Manila. And uh, we are excited about what God is going to do in our church and in our nation. So look out for that programming as well that we will make available for that conference. If you're in town, please do join us for that. The registration will be available even in the, in the link or contact us for the details. Awesome. All right, so today we're talking about warnings on wealth and riches. You know, and sometimes the question would be, why on earth would one need to be warned concerning something that apparently is so great, so good? I mean, why wouldn't, uh, why wouldn't someone be, be desiring to be rich and wealthy? Isn't that the normal state of mankind in, in his creation, when God created mankind, wasn't he wealthy 
and rich and in a, in a position of, of prosperity. What's the trouble with that? Why should we be careful when we're dealing with the subject of wealth and riches? It is important that we consider this because in many instances, people's lives have been destroyed. The issue is that if God restores prosperity, if God restores prosperity and he restores wealth and riches as it was intended in the beginning, without addressing the heart, the problem is that the heart's deceitfulness, the Bible says that the deceitfulness of riches, that there is something deceiving about wealth that can capture your heart, control your heart, and ruin your faith, and destroy your destiny, and send you to hell. This is, this is deathly serious. It is important that as we deal with the subject, talking about how God intends for us to do well, he delights in the prosperity of his servants and his saints. He is the one that said, Beloved, I wish above all things, through the Apostle John, that you prosper and be in health, even as your soul prospers. It is God's desire, yes, but it is not an ultimate ambition. It is not something that goes beyond all things. The word of God says, what shall it profit a man that he should gain the whole world and lose his soul? It is important. There are many people that have given up so much for wealth, even their soul. They have sold their soul. And so what shall it profit a man if he should gain the whole world? It is important that you realize that there are things which are more important than money and wealth. And that wealth and, and, and money and, and treasures and, and riches need to be placed within the right context. There are some of you who are going to be very wealthy. And the question is not whether you'll be wealthy or not. The question is whether uh, you'll be able to handle the wealth. The question is whether that wealth will draw you away from God. All right, so we're going to go through a few principles that will help us, warnings from the scripture with regards to this subject. The first principle is this, do not love money, love God. Do not love money. This is the first warning. <laughs> do not love money. Don't set your affections on money. You know, many times you see people on their social media, on their music videos, on some video somewhere throwing around cash, swimming in it, and just indulging in it. And, I mean, it's not inherently sinful, but it shows something in the heart. There is just a love for money that pervades our society, that people love money above all else. And God's Word teaches us that this is dangerous. And it is nothing, it has nothing to do with how poor you are or how wealthy you are. You can love money while being very poor, and you can love money while being very rich, and you can love God and not love money while being very poor, and you can love God and not love money while you're very rich. Many times the implication is made that apparently when someone is wealthy, automatically they love money. No. No, not at all the case. And so we must address this, understanding that we ought not to love money, but we ought to love God. All right, let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 2. And so he begins to teach about certain kinds of individuals and false teachers, and then he begins to pick up their attitudes as well. He says from verse 2, these are the things you are to teach and insist on. If anyone teaches otherwise and does not agree to the sound instruction or the sound doctrine of our Lord Jesus Christ and to godly teaching, this is what's wrong with them. They are conceited, puffed up, full of themselves and understand nothing. So you see already here the kind of individuals that we're going to be speaking of is people who are full of conceit. It's a kind of pride, and they understand nothing. They are ignorant, and they have an un 
healthy interest in controversies and quarrels about words that result in envy, strife, malicious talk, and evil suspicions and constant friction between people of corrupt mind who have been robbed of the truth and who think that godliness is a means to financial gain. There we go. So the word of God already begins to explain. We'll continue the scripture as it goes on. But here he already says, be careful of these kind of people. And they, they are divisive. They are conceited. They understand nothing. They try to be controversial, argumentative. And they are always creating envy and strife full of malicious talk. These are the kind of people that love money, that worship money. And then it says they've been robbed of the truth and they think that godliness is a means to financial gain. Oh, Pastor Chris, are you saying that uh, becoming a Christian won't lead to financial gain? I'm saying that that should not be your motive. Your motive should not be, let me be godly so that I can gain financial. No, you ought to be godly so that you are in right relationship with God. The Word of God says in Matthew Three, uh, 6 verse 33, seek first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added. That godliness is not a means to financial gain. Why? Because in certain instances, your godliness will part you with your money. If there is an instance of persecution and they put it to you that either you renounce your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ or this deal is over, you will at many times have to say no to certain things in order to say yes to God. And so if you put money before God, you will always compromise in that instance. And then you'll be puzzled thinking, oh, doesn't God want me to prosper? This is the corruption of the mind to think that godliness is for financial gain. No, godliness is for eternal gain. Godliness is not for financial gain. Godliness is for eternal gain. Are there fringe benefits that might produce go uh, financial gain as a result of your integrity and your diligence and your hard work and the blessing of the Lord? Absolutely. But finances are only one aspect of the blessing of God. What shall it profit a man that he should gain the whole world and lose his soul? Financial gain does not mean that you are blessed and that you are going to heaven and that you are right with God. And so it's very important that we make that distinction as we're talking about loving God instead of loving money. And then Paul continues, the Apostle Paul continues speaking to Timothy. In verse 6 he says, but godliness with contentment is great gain. So he says that these people think that godliness is a means to financial gain. But rather, godliness with contentment is where the benefit and the gain is. Then he explains why. He says, because of four, we brought nothing into the world. And we can take nothing out of it. This is a quotation from the book of Job. I was born naked, and naked will I go. We didn't bring anything into this world. And we cannot take anything out. And if you're going to be godly for the sake of financial gain, you are having a very short-sighted perspective because you might make your money at the expense of your, of your eternal destiny today. And tomorrow you have to face God in judgment. What is the value? What is the value? What is the value of gaining financially? If godliness is a means of financial gain, what is the what's the value of gaining financially, if it does not have eternal returns. And then he continues. He says in verse 8, and he explains what is this contentment. He says, but if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Those who want to get rich. Now let me stop there. It is important that you understand that the, the word of God gives us a very, very basic level of contentment. There are many who, according to the scriptures, will never ever be content. 
because they think that at this level, no, I cannot be, I'm, I, the, the kind of person that I am, there's no way that I can just be living in terms of food and clothing and that's it. No, the Apostle Paul is teaching us that you, your contentment level should be with very little. And this is why many marriages and families are put under pressure. Many children put their parents under pressure. No, my parents didn't provide for me because I didn't have Nikes and I didn't have that kind of brand and I didn't go to that kind of place and I didn't have that kind of school and I didn't have... No, you ought to be thankful if you have food and clothing. And clothing includes shelter. If we are fed, if we are covered... We ought to be content therewith to the point where we are thanking God and thanking the people that provide that. That we are thankful and full of contentment. That we, there is a joy. Contentment has an element of, of joy and peace with what you have. It comes out of your thanksgiving. But if you think that godliness is a means to gain, then your prayers are all about, Lord, give me this, Lord, give me that, Lord, give me this, Lord, give me that. And when the Lord does not come through according to your understanding, then you're going to turn around and say, what's the use of this? Many times we have seen people who came to church just for a job. And when they finally get the job because we prayed with them, then we never see them again. What a shame. You came to the Lord to get money. Perish with your money. There is no value in gaining money when you could have gained eternal life. And so we ought to learn that godliness with contentment is beneficial. If you can be godly for the sake of eternity, for the sake of relationship with God, and be content with what you have, because you brought nothing in and nothing are you going to take out. You ought to be content with food and clothing. And then he says in verse 9, Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. Wow, this is about five effects. For those who desire to be rich, they are lasting to be rich. They sing songs like, I want to be a billionaire, and I want to do this, and I want to be a millionaire, and I want to make money, and the, their only ambition in life is money because they love money. He says here, that those who want to get rich. Oh, Pastor Chris, are you saying that God is discouraging us from wanting to get rich? No. I'm saying that that desire comes with danger. This is why we are warning you. If you can be content with what you have, you're in the safe zone. If you can handle being godly and God is adding to you financially, no problem. But if your ambition is even to use people and to use God in order to get into riches, this is what will happen. It says that those who want to get rich fall into temptation. That's number one. There are some temptations that have not come across your bedroom and across your table because you are too poor. You can't afford them. And it's because of that. Some of us say, no, I'll never do that. And I'll never do that. I'll never be tempted to do this or that. My friend, <laughs> until you are there, please don't lecture anyone on what temptations you can handle. Because when, when finances and money and riches come into your hand, it will begin to show us what was there hidden. But there are many who cannot express. They can't afford prostitutes of certain caliber. They can afford, and I know that Christians ought not to be struggling even with these kind of temptations, but the word of God is not presuming on anything. It is telling us straight. It is warning us very clearly that when money comes into the picture, temptation comes with it. And then the next thing is, they fall into temptation and a trap, a setup, a trap. So when you see money coming, watch out for the traps. And then it says, into many, not few, many foolish 
and harmful desires. So you will find, all of a sudden, when money came, you start looking around and say, I think I need that. I think I need that. But when you didn't have budget for it, you had normal desires. But now that you have a budget for it, you feel like, let me go there, let me do this. Many foolish and harmful desires. And what do these desires do? They plunge people into ruin and destruction. Temptation, traps, foolish and harmful desires, ruin, destruction. If you want to get rich, be careful. There's a warning from the word of God. And then he continues to explain why this is the case in verse 10. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Many people quote this wrongly. They say because money is the root of all kinds of evil. No, it doesn't say money is the root of all kinds of evil. It says the love of money. It is not having money that's the issue. It's loving money. It's when money has you, that's when there is a problem. It says the love of money is a root. Many times it gets quoted wrongly, the root, meaning that evil only has one root, definite article. And that is the love of money. No, it is a root. A root of all kinds of evil. There are different roots of evil. And money, the love of money, is one of those roots. Of what? How many evil? All kinds. All kinds of evil. And so you ought to be careful here. The word of God is teaching us that you ought to be content. Don't think that you can use godliness to make financial gains. There are people who have joined churches because they think, oh, okay, here yeah, my business, I can, I can make connections and all of that. You are going to ruin your soul. Like Simon the sorcerer wanted to pay money so that the apostles would give him the power to lay hands on people and the Holy Spirit's power would come on them because he was covetous and full of greed and evil. And the apostle rebuked him. He said, perish with your money. You thought that you could buy the gift of God. And so there's no way to buy the gift of God. You have to realize that godliness with contentment is great gain. And then after that, you must realize that you need to be content. You need to be satisfied in your soul. So that whatever money comes is not for the satisfaction of your soul, but is for meeting needs of your family and being generous. Not to satisfy your soul. Not to make you feel like you are now something or somebody. And then it says, because those who desire to be rich, they fall into many diverse kinds of dangers and temptations and traps and all manner of desires and evil things that plunge people into ruin and destruction. Why? Because the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. And then he continues to elaborate. He says, some people eager for money. You see that? That love for money is like a lust for money. Eager for money. Everything in their life, when they wake up in the morning, it's about money. They have no thought about what God wants to do for my life. They have no desire to consider what is more important that ma than money. Money is their priority value. No, Pastor Chris. No, no, no. I don't love money. It's about the things that money can buy. Yes, we'll get to that trusting money philosophy. It is important that you stay away from this narrative in your mind that justifies the love for money. Is money important? Absolutely. But who is more important than money and who can take care of you? So this is very important. And it says some people eager for money have wandered away, wandered from the faith. They have backslided from the faith, meaning they were in the faith and they wandered away. We, remember, we, we dealt with, with this in the beginning when we were talking about whether you serve God or money. With a rich young ruler who came to Jesus and says, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, you know the commandments. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not commit adultery. And he said, oh, I've been doing them, even from my youth. Then Jesus said to him, and he loved him, and he said to him, go and sell everything that you have, 
and come and follow me and you will have uh, give it to the poor and you will have uh, treasures in heaven riches eternal riches and the man said oh no and he turned away from Jesus and Jesus didn't say whoa, whoa, whoa let's talk about this <clears throat> He knew the man already chose. He was very wealthy. He didn't just have possessions. He didn't have, have wealth, like they say. The wealth had him. The possessions had him. He couldn't give them up for Christ. He couldn't give them up for eternal life. And it says that many, because of people who are eager for money, have wandered away from the faith and have pierced themselves with many griefs, many sorrows. They have cut themselves through with many destructive, destructive, sad situations. You know, we've seen it again and again. Oh, the young man is praying and fasting. Lord, you got to give me a breakthrough in my business and all of that. And eventually when the breakthrough comes, Lord, I'm going to be your millionaire. I'm going to be your billionaire. And then when the breakthrough comes, straight to Dubai. Straight. We never ever see them in church again because now they're too good for God. They're too good for church. They used to usher. Now they can't usher anymore because they're CEO of whatever. They are CFO of something. They feel like their position determined by their money gives them an exemption from the ordinary believer. And I mean, it's overrated. You can go to Dubai. It's not all bad. <laughs> it is better to be in the house of the Lord than to dwell in the tents of the wicked. And so it's fundamental. And many people don't understand that, look, there are instances where people say, no, the money changed the person. You know, they were such a great person. And then they became rich. And all of a sudden, they were this person who's full of greed and selfishness and all of that. And many people say, no, it's just because... You know, they got, mm -mm. the money didn't, didn't make them like that. The money just revealed. This is what Henry Ford said. Henry Ford who was the founder of the Ford company, you know, the Ford motor vehicles and all. Uh, he was the, the uh, inventor of the Model T. A brilliant man. This is what he said, wealthy man. He said, money doesn't change men. It merely unmasks them. If a man is naturally selfish or arrogant, or greedy, the money brings that out. That's all. And so money is an amplifier. There are some of you, you don't, you can't handle money right now because your heart is in the wrong place. You didn't commit murder until money came. Because you could, you know, pay people off. There are certain things that people do by virtue of the fact that they feel powerful because of their money. Money is an amplifier. If you are wicked while you are poor, you'll be wicked when you are wealthy. If you are stingy while you are poor, you'll be stingy when you are wealthy. You might give some things that seem or appears like you're doing greater things, but in the heart, mm -mm, it's all the same, same, same devil. Just dressed in nice shapes, clothing, wealthy linen. So this is the first principle. You ought to love God. Warning number one. Let me warn you. <laughs> love God and don't love money. Me? Don't love money. Love God. All right. Number two is do not trust money. Trust in God. Don't trust money. Trust in God. We go here to 1 Timothy again, chapter 6, where the apostle Paul continues to speak to Timothy. And he gives a warning to the wealthy. And this is what he says. He says, warn those people. I'm reading here from the easy uh, everyday Bible. And it says, warn those people who are rich with many things that belong to this world. Meaning, warn the wealthy in this life. And let me say this. For those of us who think, no, I'm not wealthy and all of that. If you've got a phone of more than 5,000, 10,000 in your pocket right now, you are probably wealthy. If you already have a job that earns above a certain threshold, I'm telling you, if you look at the demographics of the world, some of you are in the top 20% of the world today. 
You have hot water at home. There are kings that didn't have this kind of convenience. Flashing toilet. You live in a place. You have a car. If you have a car, there are kings that, that need a horse carriages. If you have a car getting you, you around, you live in a house with two, three bedrooms. You are wealthy. I thought... You are wealthy. You just maybe mismanage your, your wealth. But in terms of relative terms in the world, you are wealthy. He says, warn these people that think they are poor, they are wealthy. Warn these people who are rich with many things that belong to this world. Tell them, this is the instruction and the warning from the apostle. He says, tell them not to think that they are more important than other people's instruction number one. When it comes to money, because when you trust money, it gives you a sense of importance and a sense of value. It says, warn them not to think that they are better or more important than other people. They must not think that their money will keep them safe. Let them not trust in their money. They could easily lose all of it. I mean, we remember, this is, I think, in the 2008 economic crash around the world financial crisis 2008 many wealthy people committed suicide as they saw their stock portfolios and their wealth and net net worth coming down why because their foundation was built on paper their foundation was built on money their foundation was built in their wealth not in christ because if Christ is your firm foundation, it doesn't matter what may come. It doesn't matter what may come. If Christ is your firm foundation, you will stand. The storms may come and beat upon that house. But in the end, they will stand because they have put the word of God to work. And many people, they trust in their money. They think that their money will keep them safe. But you can lose your money in one day. Then it instructs and it tells us what we should do rather instead. It says they should trust God. Instead of trusting money, trust God. Don't trust money. Now, it is not easy, I know, because sometimes you feel like as you're coming to, towards the end of the month and you have already spent everything on your important priorities and your bank account is crying out for supply, the level of stress that many people face in those circumstances is tremendous. And eventually when they get that message from their employer and their salary has been paid out, finally they take a sigh of relief. Oh, oh. thank God. Thank money. <laughs> and you should really consider if your heart gains a lot of peace when you have money and you don't have peace, when you only have God, maybe you should really repent because you're trusting in your money. It says that they, should, they could lose all of it. What will you do if you lose all of it? What will you do if you lose your money? What will you do if you lost today? Consider, if you lost everything that is possession and you are homeless today, what would you do? Would you be able to stand or will you end your life? Would you be able to rely on God and say, as long as I have the Lord my God, I am all right. Will you lose your mind? Will you lose your peace? Will you lose your joy? Will you lose your sanity? Will you lose your sleep? There are many people who lose sleep because of financial problems. The bills need to be paid, that and that. And I'm encouraging, of course, that we should settle our bills and many people have gone into unnecessary debts. We have been seeing testimonies of God clearing people's debts and helping them pay off these things. But many times, these same people that have received prayer and the debts were cancelled, the next year, after one year, they come back with debts again. It's amazing. Why? Because the heart and the mind have not been renewed. It's just the circumstances that have been changed by any kind of pauper. Put them in a palace, they'll turn it into a jungle. But you take a prince and you put him in a jungle, they'll, they'll turn it into a palace. And then it says, they could easily lose all of it. Instead, they should trust God. I love this part. He gives us many things. Who gives us all things 
so that we can enjoy all of them. It's awesome. Trust God who gives us all things for our enjoyment. Th this is a very unique choice of word that God would say he gives you things to enjoy. That he blesses Adam and Eve and their children for enjoyment. Those of you who think that God is only blessing so that I can evangelize the world. No, it's not just for evangelism. It's also for enjoyment. Because God made this world, he created us for his pleasure. And that we are partakers in his pleasure. He made a pleasurable world. Everything from eating to sleeping to um, uh, having children to making love with your spouse to getting married. Pleasure to standing in the sun on a cold night, on a cold morning. Pleasure. That he gave you a nervous system, a skin, a pleasure, enjoyment. God is not trying to rob you of your enjoyment, please. So trust in him. Trust in him. Money can come, but money cannot buy help. Money cannot buy a good marriage. Money cannot buy the love of your children. Money cannot buy eternal life. Money may come, but let money come and let money go if it goes. But find your trust in the Lord and find your enjoyment from the hand of the Almighty. Thank you, Lord. And so then he continues. He says in verse 18, tell those rich people. <laughs> so warn them, first of all, that they, those who are rich with many possessions in this world, tell them not to think that they are more important than others. And they must not think that their money will keep them safe. They can lose all of it. They should trust in God. He gives us all things for our enjoyment. And then he says, tell those rich people in verse 18 to do many good works, many good things to help other people. Instead of having them trust in their money and boasting and, and making themselves feel important because of their money. Let them use their money. Instead of worshiping and trusting their money and using people, let them use their money. Instead of using God and using people, let them use money to bless God and to bless people. It says, tell those rich people to do many good things to help other people. They should be very kind to other people and share their things with them. And we see this in the early church. How the wealthy were bringing lands, were bringing possessions, selling them so that they could share it with their brothers and sisters in the church. Have you seen that lately? No. And so this is the commandment from the apostolic doctrine that those who are wealthy ought to be generous. And this is what we were saying last week and the week before. That God makes grace abound to you so that you may be self-sufficient, taking care of your family, sharing and taking care of your household. And then after that, be generous at every occasion, in every instant. This is the purpose of being wealthy. Make a difference. Don't just stand out and feel important. Make a difference. And I declare that there are many of us who are rising up, who are going to be blessing other people with a home. Blessing other people by paying off their studies. Blessing other people by sending their children to school. Blessing other people by buying their clothes and food. We are the ones who are blessed to be a blessing. And then it says they must share their things. In verse 19. And some of you are thinking, if I do that, I'm going to lose everything. The word of God says, those who give will receive. Give and it shall be given unto you. And we're not going to re-preach that, but we have taught this when it came to honoring God in your giving and, and, and all of that. Verse 19, in that way they will store up. What will be the result of this kind of generosity? In that way they will store up valuable things for themselves in heaven. This is how you will store up valuable treasures in heaven. These things will be a strong help for them in the future. Wow, it is an insurance and an assurance for the future. As a result, they will have true life with God. This is what you're after. Instead of trusting money, trust God. You are after true life with God. 
and the word of God is very clear. So number one, do not love money, love God. Number two, do not trust money, trust God. Number three, build wealth progressively and invest wisely. Be careful of get rich quick skins, oh lazy person. Yes, you ought to be careful when it comes to, yeah, I just want to make money quickly. Be careful of get rich quick schemes. I'm going to read some scriptures here. But the word of God is very clear and it stands against greed, which is idolatry. The word of God says greed is idolatry. When you are, when you are greedy after money, you are worshiping money. And so it says in Proverbs 21 verse 5, the plans of the diligent lead to profit as surely as haste leads to poverty. So as you're pursuing your career, your business, be careful that you are not just after money. It is important, the word of God says, the plans of the diligent lead to profit. So God supports profit making. Please, the parable of the talent says, that the one who made, who doubled it with 10 talents was given more, and the one who didn't make any profit, that investment was taken from them. So make profit. The plans of the diligent, you got to work hard, you got to be diligent, meticulous, and make profit. But if you are just talking a lot and trying to rush, get rich quick, and you're jumping on this and that new scam and all of that, and I'm not saying that it's not possible to get wealthy quickly. But you have to be careful because it says wealth gained quickly also diminishes very quick. Proverbs 13 verse 11. Wealth from get, this is the New, new Living Translation. Wealth from get rich quick schemes quickly disappears. And wealth from hard work grows over time. And many times it has to be wealth that you will hand over to your sons and daughters and say, now take it forward, giving them a vision. And many young people get Spoil because their parents or whose parents used to suffer and they grew up with grit. Now they spoil their children. The, the children don't even do chores at home. They don't work nothing. They don't make their beds because there's a domestic worker and all of that stuff. It is important parents don't spoil your children. If you are a wealthy parent, make your children work because work has nothing to do with wealth. It, it has to do with bringing out your potential. And so it, many children have been ruined by trust funds and all sorts of wealth that came in. Why? Because they didn't have the grit and the character to handle that wealth. Wealth that comes quickly can ruin your life. We've seen many episodes on television of programs of people who won the lottery. Five million, ten million, hundred million. And in five years, it's all gone. All gone. How many sports icons and basketball players and soccer players that made millions and then they spent it all as soon as it came. Why? Because they didn't understand that they needed to invest it slowly and progressively. So this is the warning. Build wealth progressively and invest wisely. Be patient like a farmer. Don't go off to the market and buy special beans that grow in one day. It's a scam. If, you know what they say, it's, if it's too good to be true, if it sounds too good to be true, looks too good to be true, it probably is too good to be true. It's a scam. And how many of us have not been scammed into all sorts of Ponzi schemes and pyramid schemes and money-making schemes and this and that? Do honest business. Get a job. Take your money. Invest it in solid investment. And it's fine. God supports taking risks. If you look at the clouds, you're not going to sow. And so you, there is an element of taking risks, but it has to be calculated risks, not just a presentation from your uh, cousin uh, that takes all your pension money and then it's gone. And so I want to give that warning. Because people love money, because people trust money, they are easily gullible. They get pulled into all sorts of scams quickly. And so be very careful about this. I'm so excited and and blessed with the Namibian environment, the, the, the Reserve Bank and, 
and other financial uh, watchdogs are always checking out for all sorts of scams coming in. But with the advent of the internet, I'm telling you, you can send your money all the way to some small island somewhere and get scammed very quickly for a return of 50% or 100% or 200% or 400%, which is a lie. And so I want to encourage you, be involved in your business very meticulously. Do the research. Don't just, in, don't just go into all sorts of things. Amen. And spread, spread your risk. The Bible says that you need to have about seven to eight investments areas. It can't just be one thing. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. Amen. Because you think it's going to all materialize. No. Remember, progressive, progressive, progressive. Trusting in the Lord, loving the Lord, giving to God. Are you with me? And then as you are building progressively, one of the key ways in which you protect your heart from loving money and loving uh, and trusting money is your tithe and your offering and your giving to, to God and to people. Generosity is a an inoculation. It's a, a vaccine. It is an antidote to greed. Yes. So number one, do not love money, love God. Do not, number two, do not trust money, trust God. Number three, build wealth progressively and invest wisely. Pray about all your investments before you do it. Consult in the, in the multitude of, of counselors, there is wisdom. Consult with people who are in those industries. Amen? Wisely, don't just go to anyone. And then fourthly, do not covet, do not fear, because God is your helper. If you covet and if you fear, the help that God wants to give you will never reach you. So do not look to your neighbor and think, oh man, do not desire, especially do not covet unsafe people's possessions. The wicked are being fattened for the day of slaughter. Do not covet their possessions. Many music videos were looking at it. Oh, I also want a Bentley. Oh, I also want a Ferrari. Oh, I also want a Amarok. Oh, I also want a... But the driver of that thing is on his fifth marriage and they have ruined their children and they hate God. Do not covet people's possessions. Covet their relationship with God. Earnestly covet the best gifts of the Holy Spirit. And so that's the encouragement. Let's look here at Hebrews 13 as we conclude. Hebrews 13 verse 5 to 6, it says, Keep your lives free from the love of money. Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have. Why? Because God has said, Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. That's why keep your life free from the love of money and from covetousness and be content with what you have. Why? Because God gave you a promise. I will never leave you. Oh, some of us, let me say this. Some of us need to persuade ourselves of this. Please spend time meditating on the scripture of Hebrews 13, verse 5 and 6. It's an amazing scripture. And then it says, so that, in verse 6, so that we can say with confidence, God gave us a promise so we have something to say. Don't say, oh, there's no one to help me. Oh, what will I do? Oh, where will my help come from? Oh, how will I survive? How will I? No, life for a while. Don't talk like that. You are walking with God. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. He will never leave me. He will never forsake me. And sometimes when your thoughts are intrusive and your, your thoughts are just being bombarded with all manner of, of fears and how you think that you'll never amount to your neighbor's stature and you're trying to keep up with the Jonas's and with the Angolas and with the, this person and that person and that rich family and you are always in your mind perturbed and preoccupied with money, the word of God says God will not leave you. He will not forsake you. And what do you need to do then when you feel that way? You need to have something to say because you can't just think it away. You have to say it like when the devil was tempting Jesus in the wilderness. He said it is written. It is written. It is written until the devil, the devil departed. And in the same way, anxiety will go. Fear will go. 
covetousness will go. All those things will go if you trust in the Lord and his word. If you look to him, if you consider that I love God, I don't love money. I love God, he will take care of me. I trust in God, he will take care of me. And he says, so that we can say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. Not the Lord will be my helper. Not the Lord was my helper. The Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. He says we have to say this. It's not something you must think. It's something you must say. Make it your confession. Make it your declaration. On the good days, declare that. On the bad days, declare that. In the beginning of the month, when you get paid, declare that. At the end of the month, when it's almost done, declare that. The Lord is my helper. The Lord is my helper. The Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. I will not fear. The Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can mere mortals do to me? If the Lord is on my side, I will make it through. You know, one of the reasons why people love money and trust money is because they feel like that no one else will help me. And the word of God is very clear. Keep your life. Keep your life free from the love of money and covetousness. Keep your life free. Be content with what you have. Because the Lord is your helper. He said, he promised, I will never leave you. Never. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Hear the word of the Lord. You're, you're watching me today. And I'm here to encourage you and tell you this. The Lord said to you, he will never leave you. He will never forsake you. He dwells with you. He sent his Holy Spirit to live in you, knowing that he will never leave you. He knows the plan. He knows the way out of your trouble. He knows the way to provide for you. If you can extend your faith by your words, declaring the spirit of faith with believes and speaks, the Lord is my helper. The Lord is my helper. I will not fear. I refuse to fear. I refuse to be anxious. I refuse to freak out. The Lord is my helper. What can anyone do to me? Thank you, Lord. You know, there are some of you watching today and you struggle with loving money. You a struggle with trusting money. You can tell when you don't have money how anxious you become, how fearful you become. And today, you want to shift that burden over to the Lord and say, Lord, oh, thank you for reminding me that you will take care of my needs. He gives us all things richly for our enjoyment. The Lord, this is what David said, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. This is so important that we understand that the Lord wants us to have confidence in himself. It says so that we may say with confidence, looking at the future and saying, because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know, yes, I know he holds the future. Life is worth living because he lives that old him. It is important that you take seriously the word of God. The word of God believed in your heart produces the miracle you need. But remember, you are not here to gain financial gain. You are here to gain peace with God. And he will take care of you. Seek first the kingdom. All the other things are to be added after. I want to pray for you right now. And I want to pray that you will hand over that burden and that you will remove money from the throne of your heart. And that you'll start trusting in the Lord. Heavenly Father, I pray right now for every single person watching me. And I pray, Lord, that their hearts will be released now from loving money and trusting money. I pray right now in the name of Jesus for that relief to come into their heart, that peace that they will know and begin to speak. The Lord is my helper. What can man do to me? I will not be afraid. That they will declare it and declare it and declare it till it runs out of, out of their ears and out of their nose, till their whole being is saturated with this revelation. Why? Because you have said, Lord, you will never leave us. 
nor forsake us. I pray for that for every person. And Jesus, there's somebody out there, you've made some very bad investment decisions and you've lost quite a lot of money. And you're at the point where you want to give up and God is saying, I, I will restore what the enemy has stolen from you. Only put Jesus first in your life. Put him first so that when finances come, you must remember the Lord. It is he who gives you power to create wealth, to establish his cup. I pray, Father, right now, and there are, there are few people that are watching, the people who have been scammed and stolen from, they've lost their, their life savings, lost a lot. In the name of Jesus, we pray restoration. In the name of Jesus, we pray restoration. We speak life over you. We declare turnaround and testimonies are come in Jesus. Amen. If you're out there, you don't know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, you are not born again. But today you hear that the Lord can walk with you, that you don't have to trust money, worship money and, and love money, that you can love God and all the other things have to be added. And today you hear that Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world. He died for the sins of mankind. He came not to make us rich in terms of money. He came to give us more than that, eternal life. Forgiveness of sins and reconciliation with God the Father. If that's you, you want to give your life to Christ, you want to be born again. The Bible says, unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. He cannot enter the kingdom of God. Born again is not a church. It is an actual reality where you are born a spiritual being. From your parents, you were born a natural person. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but spirit gives birth to spirit. You must not be surprised that you must be born again. This is in John chapter 3. Jesus speaking to Nicodemus, persuading him, you must be born again, Nicodemus. As religious as you may be, you must be born again, and you will receive the Holy Spirit. And that's when your whole life. If that's you, you want to give your life to Christ, pray with me right now, declaring with your mouth, Declaring with your mouth what you believe in your heart. Say with me, Lord Jesus, I come to you today just as I am. I know that I'm a sinner. And today I need a Savior. I surrender my life today to your hand. I believe you died for me on the cross for all my sins. And I believe that after three days, you were raised from the dead. I confess you as my Lord and my Savior. You are alive, Lord Jesus. So come into my life. Come into my heart. Be my Lord. Be my Master. Be my Savior. Be my God. I receive eternal life, Lord Jesus. You give me eternal life right now. And from today, I'm a new creation. I'll never be the same again. In Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. If you pray that prayer, we believe a miracle has happened in your heart. It is as simple as faith in Christ. He did the, the work on the cross was what was needed so that you can just confess your way into salvation, believing with your heart, into justification. And so if you have prayed that prayer, please do reach out to us either in the comments or in the information that you see on this video, and we'll give you material. We'll, we'll uh, have you join a small group and have you grow spiritually. You're only at the beginning, but there's much more to come. And so may the Lord bless you, all of you. May the Lord cause you to shine and cause you to be a blessing where you are. May the Lord be your strength. May you love him and trust him instead of money. And may all your needs be met so that you may be self-sufficient and generous in every occasion. In Jesus' name, God bless you. We'll see you soon. Thank you for listening. For any additional information, please visit our website on ianvintuk.org.